What's up, YouTube? Welcome to another generative AI and cybersecurity conversation. My name is Brandon Carroll. I'm a developer advocate here at AWS, and today I'm joined by Mike Chambers. Mike, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody? Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm also a developer advocate, and seemingly my title now seems to be specialist in generative AI, because that's what everybody wants to talk about, and I really love talking about it too. And that's what we want to talk about today, so I'm <laughs> yes. glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. So today I wanted to talk about what we can do with generative AI in terms of using it when you work in this in a cybersecurity role. Yep. We've talked before about using it to learn about cybersecurity, um, which was a cool conversation. But I'm interested, I hear a lot of people talking about how generative AI could be useful for doing things like risk assessment or vulnerability analysis. And so I want to get your insights on that because I've been writing a, an article and doing some kind of interesting things where I feed it some log data, some flows of traffic, and I'm asking it to compare it to my security groups and my firewall rules and tell me if I have any open gaps, things like that. And for me as a security professional, that's kind of neat to be able to just ask somebody else and get the answer Absolutely. and not have to look through it myself initially. Yep. Um, but what, what are your thoughts on using it as a tool to do things like risk analysis, threat assessment, that type of stuff? Yeah, I think, I think first of all, I think it's great because I think what we need to do right now where the technology is, is start to experiment with this kind of stuff. See what we can make this do um, and just keep experimenting. So keep yeah. moving forward, absolutely. We also need to um, just keep in mind what these large language models particularly are capable of yep. um, and whether it's always the right tool for the job as well. So really compare and contrast with your expert level knowledge and see what the kinds of outputs that you get. Use it as a tool to assist you. Don't necessarily yet, I would caution, use it to run the security of your network quite yet. Right. So it's as good as the data that it's been fed, right? I mean, it. it it uses that data for determining, yeah. you know, I wouldn't say guessing, but. <laughs> sure. Well, actually, that's not a bad analogy. Guessing is probably about right. Okay. Now, we touched on this in the last video a little bit. Yeah. You know, when, you're, when you prompt a model, um, it literally makes a statistical prediction, otherwise known as a guess, as to what might come next. And so, you know, how, um, how big the model is really determines potentially the quality of that output. Yeah. So just be aware of that. You know, it, 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 it's not capable on its own. It's not capable of doing like basic mathematics. Like it might be able to sort of pretend to do mathematics because it sort of understands it from a language perspective, but okay. it's got no sort of uh, memory buffer for A and B and then add those things together. Yeah. So I will caution that if you're, if you're putting together a system that knows what A is and knows what B is, and you want to know what those two things added together are, then you should just write a normal computer program because they're really good at doing that kind of thing. Yeah. Right? So if you've got um, specific flow logs and you're looking for a specific thing, there's very easy ways that you can probably do that analysis. Now yeah. where large language models come into play, generative AI, is um, by using its sort of language understanding of what you're showing it. Now, I am aware that um, you know, the, the larger that the language models get, the better they are actually sort of simulating their understanding of this kind of knowledge to mm -hmm. the point where, where does stimulation become actual fact? So mm -hmm. if it's seen these kinds of outputs before, um, if it's seen these during its training, then there is a good chance that it will be able to sort of give you some decent insight. But okay. again, just be cautious because you know, if you show it something that nobody's ever seen before, then it's going to be a real challenge to know whether it can understand what it's looking at, find the vulnerabilities in the network, for example. Okay. So in terms of that and being able to find the vulnerabilities in the network, it, needs, it would need to know about my network would probably be a good thing. Um, so I would have to give it that information. It's already probably has information from other sources at, when it was trained. Mm. Um, so as I'm, I'm doing the, the two of those things together, I'm giving it some of my information and it's using what it knows mm. from its training um, and I'm prompting it with, um, with that. I have noticed that when, when I'm testing things that sometimes I'll issue the same prompt and mm. I'll get 
two different responses. Why is that? And yeah. is that something that we should be aware of if yeah. we're working in security? I think you should definitely be aware of it, especially if one answer is everything's fine and the other answer is, oh no, the world's on fire. Yeah. So yes. <laughs> so basically the, the way that these models have been created by the developers is that they've been, uh, maybe even a definition maybe of generative AI is a machine learning model that can approximate human ability. And so, you know, especially back at the beginning of this, we're asking them to write poems and write stories, and yeah. we want them to be creative. We don't want them to necessarily do the same thing every time. Mm -hmm. So it feels very much like there's a little random number generator in there. And there absolutely is a random number generator in there. So yeah. basically, you can actually set this when you look at a large language model parameter. Um, yeah. You can set how much it can influence it by setting the temperature. You, know, you can set the temperature really low, and it won't be very creative. Creative, um, And it might be the same predictable output all the time. Yep. Set the temperature really high, and all kinds of things can happen. And it gets super creative. Yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely something to be aware of that yeah. um, they're statistical machines yeah. with a little random number generator inside of them. Gotcha. OK. So it sounds like we're still in very early stages of the possibilities of using this technology for cybersecurity purposes. Right. Not to say that we that we can't use it now to gain helpful insights. Um, but you had made the comment about writing a, a, a program, like put together a program, and if you want the same output every single time, sometimes mm -hmm. it's easier just to, to write that. Um, what kind of scenario could you see a, a benefit for with generative AI and yeah. And using it in the security world. And th this, I think, is the, is the best use case right now for generative AI in this particular scenario. And that's using generative AI to help you write code. So Code Whisperer from AWS is a service that you can, um, or it's a plugin that you can put yeah. into your IDE. So yeah. if you're writing away in Visual Studio or whatever you're using, you can put that um, in there. And as you're developing code, it will be doing some, just more than just code completion, right? It's actually looking yeah. at um, the definite, you're starting to define a function, you're giving it an intuitive name, and it says, right, fine, I can write that rest of that function for you. And so it's about productivity. Um, yeah. And then, of course, you're there owning that code and checking that code. So yeah. it's a bit safer than letting it loose on your network and say, go and change my firewall rules. Right. Um, you know, there's a little bit of uh, human check going on there. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, uh, working with Code Whisper, I have it in VS Code. Yeah. Uh, you know, I use VS Code, and I've been writing prompts and doing that through Python and, and just testing. And as I'm typing the text for the prompt, right. it, it knows what I want to ask, and it starts to help complete that, too. So oh, it completes the prompt, not <laughs> just the code. It's been, it's, been, it's been creating sentences for me, which I thought was pretty, pretty neat. That's awesome. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing where we go with these, these capabilities. I think there's, there's a lot of possibilities, and I'm really excited about where we are now and where we're going to be in the future. So 100%. Thank you for the insights. Appreciate you being here. If people want to learn more, where do they go? Yeah, well, look, behind us, we've got the generative AI space on community.aws. And you'll see my picture floating around here a couple of times, because yes, I've made some videos and put them up there. There's Tiffany actually talking about Code Whisperer. So there's a whole playlist of videos about Code Whisperer up there, too. So yeah, go and have a look at this uh, space. Maybe you can put a link to this below this video. We'll um, it's a great location for getting more insight about generative AI. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Mike. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this useful. If you enjoyed this video and you want more, be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll get that to you. Thanks for watching.